Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello. Welcome to this uh, session. Hello and welcome to our online audience. We're here today together to talk about the cost of living crisis. Important topic, of course, that you've been touching uh, through different sessions here in Davos, but we will try and go into the, the facts and then the solutions maybe um, with our panelists. And thank you. Thank you. I will present them uh, in a few seconds. Over the course of the pandemic, uh, close to 100 million people are estimated to have fallen in extreme poverty. Uh, these people add uh, to populations who were already uh, in that state of extreme poverty before the pandemic. Now, of course, the war in Ukraine uh, is bringing high disruptions and uh, uh, the price of food and fuel are creating a new uh, issue uh, in terms of cost of living crisis. At the same time, of course, uh, the wealth of the world's richest uh, people has doubled and we will uh, have the contribution of our, um, of our uh, director of Oxfam here. She will talk of that, of course. So what steps can be taken uh, to tackle this uh, inequality within countries and also on an international level? That's what we will try to talk about. Uh, with me today, um, I'm pleased to introduce um, Mr. Vam Katatorian, the president of Armenia. Um, as well, uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. Gabriela Butcher, uh, executive director of Oxfam International. Uh, Mr. Akim Steiner, administrator of the United Nations uh, Development Program, and Amit Stiber, his founder and director of Vital Capital Environment, and that's an impact investment fund in Cyprus. We will have uh, about 30 minutes and then we can take some questions uh, and interact with you. So if you do have questions, please keep them and make a sign afterwards. Uh, I'll be happy to give the floor and the microphone to you. So let's jump into uh, this uh, topic. And I would start with, uh, with you, Gabriela, um, which uh, Oxfam yesterday published. Uh, you published your report. Uh, as you usually do. And so if I read the, the, the figures that you gave, uh, you said uh, with this title, uh, pandemic creates new billionaire every 30 hours and a million people could fall into extreme poverty at the same rate in 2022, every um, 33 hours. So you expect this year that 263 million more people will crash into extreme poverty. Can you tell us more about those figures and the facts um, that you bring out with your reports? Yes, thank you very much. And I'm great to be here to be talking about this cost of living crisis, which is our, the name of our panel. But yes, it's definitely an inequality crisis. Um, and our report that we published yesterday as Oxfam profiting from pain, as you said, emphasizes the extreme rise in billionaire wealth during the pandemic. So it's 24 months and, um, you know, we've never seen this level of accumulation. And at the same time, uh, at the other end of the scale, we are seeing, unfortunately, such a large number. These uh, World Bank figures of extreme poverty um, that we've also uh, added um, a factor of inequality, uh, which you know, as a projection, of course, we will always, uh, at the end of the year, find out uh, how, unfortunately, how many people in the end um, crash into extreme poverty. But our projection is 263 million, which is unprecedented levels. Um, because of the rise in inequality, and now, of course, we have the impact of, of the food crisis, the hunger crisis, and we know 193 million people are in severe hunger conditions, and with uh, so many uh, impacted also now by climate change. We have a, a series of, of crises that are building on each other, and, and a moment when we definitely need to think differently and act differently, and, and this is why we're here at the World Economic Forum speaking about measures that we can take and how we need to act with urgency um, in, in the face of, of so much suffering and, and so much, um, in fact, um, in the end, this is causing deaths. And in, in, you know, I was six weeks ago, I was in Somalia in, in witnessing firsthand what is happening there in terms of 
of the hunger crisis. And the Horn of Africa is experiencing its worst drought in over 40 years, compounded by this crisis uh, of climate. And um, and inflation, plus the war in Ukraine, the, the cost of, of um, food, it's all imported. So all these situations are creating um, um, the fact that one person is, is dying in the Horn of Africa every 48 seconds. And, and if this were the only thing happening in the world, we would probably all be focusing on that uh, instead of all the other crises. So I want to bring attention to that and say it's cost of living, yes, but we're beyond that. It's actually we're talking about survival crisis and, and we need action. And one example of what a company can do, we projected if Walmart, which has focused so, focused so much on, on shareholder um, if, um, you know, impact for themselves um, could um, change their, their approach. And instead of paying 16 billion to their shareholders, they were to um, increase wages for their 1.6 million workers by $10,000 each. They would you know, each benefit 1.6 million people. But in fact, that company changing their approach would reduce inequality in, in the US. And imagine if they did that along their supply chain. So the supply chain is along the, throughout the world. So we're talking about fair wages, living wages. The companies can, can have an, an impact on uh, as a matter of decision. Thank you. We'll come back to the actions afterwards. But thank, thank you very much for, for touching uh, already uh, that issue. Um, Mr. Steiner, unprecedented levels and also this inequality, so this poverty, but also inequalities. Can you build on that? How can you uh, consider and, and qualify the situation today if you compare it historically? Well, let me pick up where Gabriela left off. I think this understanding that we are more and more clearly able to discern both from the empirical, the, the research on poverty, and its intersection with inequality, I think, is extremely important, particularly in our world of today, because um, we are in a different place than we were 100 years ago, where if there was a drought, there was no global world food program, or there was no Oxfam. I mean, essentially, you either were able to become part of a diaspora, or you would simply you know, either survive barely or die. And I think that, that absolute level of poverty, which is then compounded by a natural disaster, on that front, we have made quite a lot of progress over the last 100 years. And I think even as we speak today, there's roughly 100 million people who are currently receiving some form of um, uh, food aid simply because they find themselves as refugees or displaced by natural disaster. It's a, the, the humanitarian system that the world has built up is a significant safety net. But what it does not deal with ultimately is that poverty combined with inequality is actually increasingly a driver also of poverty and all that we associate with it. Let me just give you an example. You know, we're living through an extraordinary moment where food prices are exploding, energy prices are exploding. If you take an average household income on the African continent, this is a very average figure. Um, you know, on average, an African household will spend 40% of their income on food. Now, imagine a poor household is probably 70, 80% of its income. Any increase in price fundamentally affects that household differently to somebody who has a job, who has some savings, who is able to, in a sense, weather this particular moment. Um, if it's food and fuel put together, which is you know, the two basic things that you often rely on, whether it's through electricity or you know, um, kerosene or uh, the price for transport to work with your taxis, you see an immediate multiplier taking place. So I think it's extremely important that we do look at this issue of inequality very clearly, because it's actually become a major additional factor in explaining poverty in our time. Secondly, um, multidimensional poverty. Um, UNDP, many of us who work in, in the field of uh, poverty eradication, have um, for many years advocated to move beyond this notion that a per capita income best captures what poverty is about. It's why UNDP 30 years ago started developing the Human Development Index uh, with the Human Development Report. Uh, in fact, in, in Oxford, um, there is a research center there with whom we work very closely together, you probably as well, on this issue of the multidimensional poverty concept. Understanding that poverty, um, as Amartya Sen also pointed out, is not just the absence of you know, physical goods or income. 
It is essentially about being able to fulfill human capabilities, to have agency, to exercise choices in your life. And I think a lot of what is beginning to preoccupy um, me and many others, I think, at this moment is that we have, and this is my point about the historical trend, we have a larger and larger number of people in this world who define themselves essentially by recognizing their society as being unfair. And this has nothing to do with per capita income. You know, it's unfairness at a higher level of per capita income, but a feeling of unjustness, of um, being deprived of opportunities. And think back to before the pandemic. Um, we were actually struggling worldwide with inequality already. We had riots, political reactions, political radicalization in the United States, in Hong Kong, in Chile, uh, in Paris. This was a phenomenon that I think has a lot to do with how poverty, inequality, and some of the phenomena you have described, Gabriela, um, essentially erode social cohesion and ultimately a society's belief or confidence in its own development pathway or how those who exercise power and on, on our behalf essentially decide. So this moment right now is an awful moment because we are being hit by already a great deal of tension within our society. There's a pandemic on top which has increased by 100 million plus. And now you're going to see just in the next few months, as Gabriela pointed out, many more people finding themselves below the poverty line. And let me add one last um, appeal also. In part, it is also in the way that we as an international community react or are not responding to this. Humanitarian support alone cannot alleviate poverty worldwide. <coughs> Afghanistan, Syria, the unresolved conflicts in which the international community opts not to um, look beyond a kind of lifeline approach of a drip, um, we actually become part of making the problem of poverty worse. Syria today has more than 95% of its people living below the poverty line. Afghanistan is in economic freefall, and by the middle or end of this year, 95% of Afghans will be living below the poverty line. This is a systemic failure of many different factors. Thank you. <laughs> I see you nodding. Um, so this is... I will continue the thought of Mr. Steiner. One, two, three, four, test, test, test. One, two, three, four. One. In fact, what happened in Afghanistan and in Syria, it should be very informative for us. The point is that so that uh, we went there to work with best wishes. But uh, those activities did not yield the results that we were expecting. And in both of the countries, uh, the poverty has become a very serious issue. It has not gone down. Democratic rule has not been established there, unfortunately. And uh, there is another important factor that we did not take into account. Whether the steps taken in uh, those countries uh, achieve their objectives or not, whatever we understood, uh, good life, quality life, where people would have an opportunity to get education, to get quality services, whether those messages would reach the addresses or not. 
I am more than confident that if we conduct the study, then all of those initiatives and intentions have not been fulfilled. And I do believe that we all face a problem because in certain in certain cases they highlight the political steps than the changes in real life. I do believe that in Afghanistan some political programs would be implemented. So this is the truth that we have to table, that we have to voice. I allow myself to talk like that because I used to live in a country that would be called the Soviet Union. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we had an opportunity of becoming an independent country and to build our lives on our own. But we decided that uh, the democratic values are the most important for us. Very many former Soviet republics uh, adopted another way. So our Baltic countries integrated into the modern world they became dynamically developing countries. Countries of Central Asia so adopted another regime, authoritarian regime of government, where democracy, uh, democracy was less, much less. So we chose our own way. I regret to say that from times to times we find ourselves in crisis, but we try to overcome those crises in a unique way because the condition for our crisis is that we have closed borders and it has got a serious impact on the quality of our life. I'm talking about Turkey and Azerbaijan. We have an unsolved issue of Nagorno-Karabakh that always keeps us into conflict with our neighboring Azerbaijan. This is regretful, but this is reality. And only 18 months ago, we were in war. As a result of 44 days of war, an agreement was signed that, that the war is supposed to be stopped, but there were a lot of losses. And now we are in a new crisis. But we managed to uh, overcome that crisis because there were um, democratic principles that we have adopted uh, come to our rescue. And the most important issue that uh, we have is the relationships between the authorities and the public in general. How? much is the confidence of the public in general towards the incumbent authorities, i.e. government. And uh, from the other hand, how well is government understanding the challenges of the population? If uh, the dialogue is there and the poverty issue will be solved and the likelihood of new crisis goes down and the country becomes more stable and more manageable. But the uh, most important thing is to be faithful to your principles. And uh, the experience of our country comes to show this. Up to 2018, from 2000, our country, what can say, not fully, but mostly our country denied the democratic values. And uh, the corruption was just eating our country. And uh, we found ourselves in an extremely bad situation. And in 2018, a Dalvat revolution took place in our country. And as a result of this revolution, a young government came to power that inspired a new confidence to everyone. The business felt freedom. People felt freedom. People could easily get into business and no one could uh, create uh, obstacles for them, no one could take bribe for them. So the political uh, forces had an opportunity of participating to the elections in equal conditions. And economy had an immediately 7.5% of growth. The following year we had 7.5% of the economy growth. So the business people understood that the government is not working with them with the temporary uh, rules of the game, but that these are stable and well-established rules of game. Which are those rules? Those rules are said to pay taxes and to do some social obligations. 
this is a model. This is an example that can be interesting for many. As an expert, I I would assess that the elimination and eradication of corruption would be a very serious impetus. But uh, frankly speaking, I could not imagine that the eradication of corruption could be so much beneficial. This is a very serious factor, especially for international companies and organizations that are doing very important work in other parts of the world. When when the money that they spent in various countries reach the actual beneficiaries that are designated for, then the poverty will be reduced and the risks will be reduced. And everything will become more manageable. But uh, if the money, if those resources uh, go to the pockets uh, for a group of the people who use this money only for keeping their government, their power, it is. Um, uh, pregnant with uh, many conflicts. And I do believe that you can bring very many conflicts. So one very important request to you. Of course, there are political uh, reasons uh, that we close our eyes to. But I do not uh, really think that in such cases this is the correct solution. It's better to be honest, frank, especially with the people, especially with the people that you want to help. And uh, you should involve them in all your initiatives, all of your projects, because this is the only way to control. And I'm talking to you from the experience of our country, from my personal experience. So I will be then, uh, let me further present myself. I consider myself to be also a crisis manager because do, during the extreme crisis times of early 1990s, I was the mayor of the capital of Armenia, Yerevan, for four years. In fact, uh, I wouldn't be able to hold that position, that office, for so long. People uh, would not f forget, forgive me for unbearable conditions that they lived in Yerevan without running water, without electricity, without public transport. So Yerevan is a city of a million population with modern infrastructure. So, so the, the Yerevan was the city with one of the most beautiful architecture of Soviet Union, and, and it had a reputation of as a beautiful city with quality of life. But the war blockade uh, deprived us of an opportunity to get uh, gas and electricity. But uh, for four years, people bear with, bore with me, bore with my team, because of one reason. We honestly talked to them, openly talked to them. We told them that this is our common problem. It doesn't matter that I'm the mayor and you're just an ordinary citizen of the city. Let's help each other. And I've always used this opportunity to, to express my gratitude to the citizens of Yerevan who under these very difficult circumstances behaved with uh, dignity. They didn't break the windows of a municipality. They didn't close the streets. They didn't do demonstrations. Simply, we were all in the same boat. Probably so much at this point of time. Thank you very much. So you gave us a, um, a great description, a description about the importance of, of the political conditions, and I guess we can come back to that afterwards. But I first would like to give the floor to Mr. Stibbe about the infrastructure. You mentioned this uh, issue also, and you have been working as an investor through your impact yeah, fund. Yes. Uh, uh, on, on this issue. Can you give us a few examples of actions that can help really to reduce poverty and also inequalities? Uh, thank you, Madeleine. I'm uh, happy to be here in the forum. Uh, yes, in the past 10 years in Vital, we've been investing and developing uh, and addressing actually these basic needs in high growth countries, meaning food, meaning water, mm -hmm. meaning health, uh, sustainable infrastructure. Um, using technologies, for example, to, I, I think, to solve these problems of uh, high-growth countries that are behind and the gaps that are only growing, 
uh, we have to connect our values to our investments. And uh, for the past 10 years, we are, from the beginning, an impact investment fund. Uh, impact means intentional, positive impact. Uh, the goal of the investment is to do impact as well as uh, market uh, rate and risk adjusted uh, profits. And I think uh, today in the situation in the world we don't have the privilege not to do 100% uh, investments in order, uh, according to our values and, uh, and to measure it and to uh, and I, there was, uh, Steiner said, uh, the SDGs gave us a f good framework of measuring and a good framework of work. So uh, I think in everything we do, we address that. I can give a few examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, seeing uh, India dry up uh, and due to climate change and due to the population growing, uh, we built a company called Vital Environment uh, to address to make sure that uh, thousands of villages get uh, safe water and uh, together with the Indian government who has really large schemes of irrigation schemes to use the water very uh, wisely and efficiently in, uh, and uh, give farmers uh, the ability to have more than one season a year. Uh, India, is, the scarcity of water is, com is completely crazy. It's, uh, in 2019, Chennai, 10 million people run out of water and trains start uh, bringing water in inside the city. So uh, it's, a, it's a great need to uh, manage uh, the, wa the water situation in a very uh, holistic way. We have a good, I, I be personally, based in Israel, we have a good example. Israel is a scarce uh, water area, and we needed to solve it during the years. So uh, non-revenue water in Israel is extremely low. It's only 5% less. And, uh, we recycle all the agriculture in the country basically is uh, uh, recycled water. We recycle 85% of the sewage. So everything is, is, is planned very wisely. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a nice uh, pilot for the uh, world and the high growth countries that are now beginning to build the infrastructure. Uh, that will, things that we are trying to uh, do there. Another, uh, example in agriculture is uh, uh, building agro-processing centers near the farmers in Africa, um, making the basically uh, transferring knowledge to the farmers around the center. They are the farmers bringing again from Israel a bit uh, the moshav concept, community farming, having the uh, infrastructure, the heavy machinery or the processing centers owned by the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or owned by us as a private entity and we give credit and, of inputs and then uh, trade with the farmers and we can show uh, great results of uh, 8x on the uh, 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 farmer's income uh, and farmers around the center uh, income is higher uh, uh, eight times than a normal farmer in the country. Um, yeah, we have uh, other examples of uh, technologies that can help uh, uh, putting communities, African communities, Mozambique projects under the World Bank that we're doing of digitizing land ownership, basically giving people an asset, their first asset. They can take loans on, they can take mortgage. It, it, bring, it basically puts them on the map mm -hmm. uh, of, of the economy, of the global economy. So addressing these b basic needs is what we do. In, uh, Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Steiner, in the previous session this morning, you mentioned uh, that climate and digitization were either a threat or an opportunity, and we have nice examples here. Can you maybe uh, uh, build on that uh, and, and tell us how it can be used, um, indeed, to go into the right direction? Well, put very briefly on top of all the conditions that all my three panelists have just described, um, we also looked, um, because with UNDP, we, we, we also try to think very much about what, what is the future of development whole, because decisions taken today in part determine how resilient a society and economy will be tomorrow. So much of the focus, particularly when it comes to the UNDP's human development reports, has been to try and understand what is it that countries can do about this, and I'm sure we're going to speak more about this. And um, interesting, in 2019, the human development report, when it looked at inequality and, and how it was evolving, it also looked at the contemporary drivers and the two that it identified that had the greatest relevance to what would happen to 
inequality turned out to be digitalization and climate change. And interesting enough, both of them holding within them the seeds of either making it much worse, i.e. an amplifier of inequality, or um, if you want a, uh, the opposite, uh, reducing inequality. And I think part of um, this applies as much to inequality as it does to poverty. And so we have spoken about a lot of the, the phenomena of poverty. I think, President, you alluded to it. Governance becomes a fundamental way in which you can tackle poverty. The symptoms you describe, Gabriela, in part are the products of choices to act, not to act, of certain policies, of whether we tax or do not tax, how we tax. Um, you know, a fossil fuel subsidy. I mean, if we have this fascinating debate again right now. I mean, sometimes you do wonder whether we ever learn anything. <laughs> you know, here we are with a $120 uh, a barrel oil price. And what happens? We start debating again how we can bring the price down for a liter of, of gasoline at the petrol pump. This is the most inefficient, any economist, I hope you will agree with me, inefficient instrument that you can think of in terms of actually dealing with what is clearly a very disruptive um, increase in the cost of living, the theme of our panel. Mm. But we have learned over years, first of all, by subsidizing fossil fuel consumption, it's a regressive subsidy. I, the richest, who are the largest consumers proportionately, get the most money. So if you want to help the poor, you are really spending your money badly. Secondly, you're actually encouraging climate change to continue, which will again harm the poor uh, more badly. So governance policies um, are crucial in the way we apply them. But digital is an illustration also of what has, in a sense, become a, a realm of possibility. E-government, we spoke about it yesterday, can be a very significant way in, first of all, delivering services to citizens at much lower cost, something that many governments are extremely interested in because they are very constrained in their budgets. But it also opens up a whole new um, realm of, for example, um, inclusive finance. If we want to combat poverty, Remember, in many countries until recently, if you were poor, the banking system simply did not want to know about you. You had no collateral, you had no address, you had no credit history. Don't come to our branch. I lived for 10 years in Kenya. I, I lived alongside the you know, emergence of what is called M-Pesa. Some of you may have heard about it. An extraordinary revolution that, interesting enough, of digital payment platforms ultimately was allowed to succeed because the central bank governor at the time decided that a phone company service provider would be allowed to have financial, um, I mean, basically money in their accounts overnight. Because normally that's, you know, regulatory rules, banks can only do that. The central bank it took a deliberate decision to allow this to happen and a revolution uh, followed where, you know, women today Young people can transact at virtually no cost in the financial system. They are part of it. You can actually borrow money in the morning to buy your produce on the wholesale market, take it to your local market, sell it and repay your loan all on the cell phone. This is the revolution that digital technologies can, can provide. So I think we have many solutions. They begin with the kind of society we choose to be. Our taxation system often is an expression of that. Um, and it is then very deliberate, poverty eradication, inequality reducing policies that look at life from the vantage point of a poor person rather than the rich person who is simply concerned about how do I avoid these people starting to go out on the streets and, and maybe rioting. It is a slightly caricatured way, but unfortunately our poverty discussions sometimes are very much characterized by who we are and where we live in a moment like this. <laughs> Thank you. We will uh, have a few minutes for questions. If you, yes, please. Thank you so much. I'm Alexis Taylor. I'm a global shaper from Austin, Texas in the US. And one of my questions is around the global wealth tax. There's been more people calling for that as a potential solution to start addressing inequality. And I'm wondering if we had a global wealth tax today and we had that funding, where should it be spent and are redistributed to have the most impact on the challenges that we are talking about in this session? Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you, Alexis, for asking that question because I would have wanted to go into the tax and as I, uh, building on what the panelists have said, you know, these are questions of political will, of choice, mm -hmm. and it's 
inequality is not inevitable and we have multiple examples here so taxing is, is one of them and wealth taxation can be also a choice in per country rather than waiting and uh, for a global wealth taxation agreement like the one we've had for corporate taxation so st starting and and we calculated in our report so if for taxation at two percent um, for individual wealth going up to 5% um, for billionaires, so looking at raising uh, with those small percentages, we can raise uh, 2.3, uh, $2.5 trillion, uh, which would be enough to lift 2.3 billion people out of poverty, deliver universal health care and social protection for everyone living in low and lower middle income countries, so nearly half the world. And that's what we can do with those low percentages. If we have the political will, that's in, uh, calculating if all countries did it uh, at that level at the same time, which is totally doable and, and given the, the scale of the crisis. But it requires, of course, social dialogue and agreements and, and transparency and many elements. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the point is not about taxes. If we reduce taxes, we must know that from that we will not in, enable to collect money or in case of increasing in expecting that we are going to invest into the programs that are going to reduce the poverty. Well, I think I think that we have to discuss the issue of efficiency of the use of the resources. And we should more seriously discuss the reasons of poverty. This is a principal point because I have been dealing with the poverty reduction as well. So poverty is consequence. And we have to find the reason. Oh, this is consequence of what reason, what cause. For example, in our country, uh, the, the poverty is the result of low productivity of work. We must be able to apply new technologies in agriculture, in economy, uh, that will help the government in regard of collecting the taxes. And from the other hand, it will help to implement social programs. And the people who work, that will help these people to make more money. I think that, that there are models of the countries who have gone this way. So in this regard, I am a bit cautious about this specific type of tax. Of course, uh, I'm not familiar with the report. I'm not familiar with the report of Oxfam. I will personally look at it. And, uh, and I will submit maybe my feedback, not as a president, but as an economist. So, uh, so this discussion has nothing to do with my position as the president. Because uh, these are issues which are interconnected. Look, we have a problem of inflation. All the economists knew that the problem was going to come uh, because the economic support or fight against COVID would e inevitably lead to this. So in U.S. they spent several trillion, the European Union spent several trillion. These are, these are probably the most important reasons of inflation. But we were not ready for this. So in case of wars, in case of uh, global turbulence, when food and oil prices uh, went up, this was an additional burden. Oh, well, what were our actions? Like eradicate COVID, let's help people, let's give them money. But what's next? We will, you know, COVID would not be endless. After two years, we were supposed to feel the consequences of this. So there is a very good saying. There is no free lunch. You have to pay for everything. The same is also in the personal life and also in our public life. It's just like that. We must be ready for that. Thank you. I would also. Yes, please. Can we have another question here? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli. I'm a social entrepreneur. I work in the food and agricultural landscape in Africa. And uh, thank you for your comments and for your work. I have one comment and one question. The comment is, um, I've started a new initiative after working for 25 years called Changing Narratives Africa because it really uh, makes me very sad when we paint the picture of Africa as a hungry child yeah. um, because it's a single story. Um, so I'm just appealing to my brothers and sisters on the stage to be very careful about the narratives you paint because when we do try to change them, we're often seen as actors who don't have agency and who can deliver impact in our own backyard. So it's just a nuanced and I'll be happy to talk offline. Now the question is, a lot of um, sessions I've gone to is around how can we help with relief, there's an emerging food crisis, and I'm curious whether any of you have seen studies that measure the impact of interventions post uh, relief, because oftentimes it distorts uh, the local food ecosystem and actually makes prices rise for the uh, rest of the population and drives them into poverty. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting very concerned about some of the interventions I'm hearing being touted around in the global arena. So that's one question I'll have for you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Maybe, Mr. Uh, Chibe, you could, you could start on that one. Yeah. I know you want to measure the impact of your actions. And, and we do. We do measure uh, the outcomes and the outputs of uh, everything we do. We can uh, show that uh, our, for example, we, uh, poultry in Angola, we built an agro-processing center that did 20% of the production. We know to say that 60% went to uh, of the eggs sold went to the lowest uh, part of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do measure that. We do measure our beneficiaries. Who is the beneficiary? And we do, uh, and we can show that uh, results in everything we do. One comment on tax. I uh, from from my uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, have the chance uh, earlier. Um, from my point of view, as the, the developer investor in the field, uh, I'm, I'm always for more, uh, more resources, but I think also when uh, institutional resources need to understand they need to take more risk as they see it now, because if they won't take more, it's actually more risky not to invest in these places. And if COVID taught us something that uh, solving uh, problems in uh, in developing countries is solving problems also for the world and where everything is connected. So I think uh, that collect, collect more taxes is good, but make, the, uh, make it efficient, as you said, and, and uh, let I know, people on ground yeah. and take risks on people on ground yeah. and because my bottleneck is funding and I don't think that uh, uh, well, that's one example for, for that. So. Uh, taking more risk with the, with the taxes and with the institutional money we have. Uh, a few more examples of, uh, of measurement. Uh, if you, you... Do you want to address I think... Uh, yes. Relief, yeah. Could yeah. I so. maybe respond? Uh, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just uh. wanted... I agree very much with your issue of the single story. Um, and um, in, when I was in Somalia, as I said, six weeks ago, I met lots of entrepreneurs and, you know, a huge dynamic uh, scene. At the same time, I feel it's morally important to express the suffering that is there and the need for, for solidarity. But the investment, and we also launched a report last week called Dangerous Delays, the point is to prevent and uh, Save the Children in Oxfam together uh, published that report. And we know how to do it, and we have done it uh, together with uh, very much um, uh, local organizations that are uh, very well placed to do it themselves, but it's a partnership. So that is the, the types of investments we all want to do. When the taxation that I was talking about is new wealth taxation. So at the moment, of all the taxation in the world, only 4% is wealth taxation. And, and so we're of individuals. And that is an un, untapped resource in all countries, including even Somalia, which may be one of the poorest, but everywhere there is inequality and there's possibility of wealth taxation. So it's a question of decisions by countries, and it's yeah. not to be imposed in any way, but it's an opportunity given the, the situation in which we are. And then, of course, other measures to help address in the urgency. We need to think long term, as has been discussed, but also now what do people need, like uh, eliminating VAT on, on foods, because we, we, we need to make sure that, um, that uh, 
people can access uh, and those you know VAT is not a progressive measure so we need to have progressive taxation which in itself reduces inequality thank you very much I'm, I'm afraid we are um, out of time <laughs> It went very quickly, uh, very uh, big issues, of course, and we see that there's still some discussions about the solutions, of course, but I will quote one of you saying, it all begins with the societies we choose to be. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and have a nice uh, evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.